hello friends i'll be talking on this topic very briefly hyperhomocysteinemia so i'm sure most of the intensivists would be dealing with stroke in ang or ang patients having myocardial infarction coming to icu and very often we do work them up for the procoagulant state and one of them that figures out is uh, homocysteinemia or hyperhomocysteinemia so we just need to have some clarity as to why this is a dreaded situation and whether there are any modifiable factors and whether this can be treated at all so i wish to acknowledge my colleague uh, dr arun who helped me develop this content so it's more most of the physicians would know and have some clarity on this particular topic so it's good intensivists also have some clarity so this is just a figurative representation and all these uh, things you see are the homocysteine and which has caused atheromatous plaque disruption so when we talk about homocysteine the whole uh, subject is to do with the metabolic pathway so homocysteine is a non proteinogenic alpha amino acid which is very similar to cysteine so it's a homologue of cysteine but additionally it has methylene blue uh, methylene bridge so this is the methylene bridge which uh, cysteine has in addition which cause uh, which causes this uh, homocysteine so it is a analog of cysteine so when we look at so for all of us to have some understanding we need to have a clarity on its metabolic pathway so methionin is converted to homocysteine so this is little interesting uh, with the loss of c methyl group methionine is converted to homocysteine so in the body the crux of the hyperhomocysteinemia is this homocysteine which is present in the body should be reconverted to methionine or should be converted to cysteine so and that happens in the presence of vitamins so homocysteine cannot remain in the body at a high levels so this this is sort of a cycling that keeps happening within the body methionine converts to homocysteine and homocysteine gets reconverted in the presence adequate amount of vitamin b6 b9 or b12 so it gets reconverted into methionine and as you know b9 is folic acid b6 is pyridoxine and b12 so so these are the vitamins that are important for its reconversion so there are only two pathways that homocysteine tends to uh, take so there is one pathway where homocysteine gets converted to methionine by tetrahydrofolate so any mutation so most of the hyperhomocysteinemia that we see in young adults is mostly genetically sort of manifested where there is a aberration in the genetic pathway so uh, one of them is homocysteine converts to methionine in the presence of tetrahydrofolate and if there is genetic mutation of the mthf which is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase Uh, then this conversion doesn't happen and there is high levels of homocysteine or homocysteine gets converted to cysteine in the presence of cbs which is cysteine beta synthase so if we have an ing individual with hyperhomocysteinemia then these pathways are interrupted so where there is a mutation in the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase or there is mutation in the cysteine beta synthase so these are the two genetic pathways which commonly causes hyperhomocysteinemia so albeit if you have this vitamins in a subnormal level if you have b6 or b9 or b12 in a subnormal level so whatever little conversion should happen also can be mitigated so etiology predominantly in young individuals it will be genetically mediated so the common genetic mutation 40% of the type this reconversion of homocysteine to methionine where it needs tetrahydrofolate so there is a methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase mutation that happens in 40% which prevents the conversion of homocysteine to methionine so that is a common cause or the second common is where you have muta mutation in the cysteine beta synthetase where homocysteine is prevented from being converted to cysteine so either homocysteine is not converted to cysteine or it is not converted to methionine because of the mutations and that is the commoner cause and the the acquired causes which is the deficiency of this vitamins is little less common because most of them are genetically so nutritional as i said reduction in the folic acid b9 or reduction of vitamin b12 or vitamin b6 which is pyridoxine this is little uncommon so this is the nutritional sort of a cause which is seldom does happen but one needs to keep this vitamins 
at an optimal level. They should not be at a suboptimal level, even if it is a genetically mediated, because then these conversions don't happen. So obviously for all the listeners, you know, vitamin B12 is increasingly being recognized as a very uh, sort of a valuable vitamin and depletion of this vitamin is associated with cardiovascular risk and uh, cerebrovascular risk. So the causes of vitamin B12, I'm sure most of you just put in a figurative way, ethanol dependence or alcohol dependent people have low vitamin B12 or someone who is nutritionally depleted or who are vegetarians because vegetarian diet has less of vitamin B12 and the commonest cause in Indian setting is the intrinsic factor deficiency where they have atrophic gastritis because you need intrinsic factor for the absorption of the vitamin B12 and because Indian gut have this atrophic sort of a gastritis, the intrinsic factor is sort of depleted because they are produced by this uh, mucosal lining of the parietal cells and this gets depleted and there is uh, inability for the B12 absorption that happens or someone who's undergone total gastrectomy or any disease affecting the ileum or the terminal ileum because that is where the maximum B12 absorption happens. So, so someone has a Crohn's disease or iliac resection or, or tuberculosis of the ileal, uh, il uh, ileum or the cecum. So these are the conditions which could lead to vitamin B12 deficiency. And transcobalamin deficiency is little rare, but the common causes is nutritional, alcohol dependence, or gut disturbance. And most Indians, as I said, have intrinsic factor deficiency due to atrophic gastritis. And that is one of the commonest reasons why B12 doesn't get absorbed. Or any of the small bowel problems, especially uh, confined to the terminal ileum, leads to B12 deficiency. And there are other conditions which lead to high homocysteine and some some of them are systemic diseases which we need to keep in mind. So hypothyroidism because we know that hypothyroidism have a risk for hypercholesterolemia and they are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and they also can have hyperhomocysteinemia. Psoriasis, I am sure most listeners would know psoriasis have a high odds ratio of developing cardiovascular disease and psoriasis have hyperhomocysteinemia and CKD patients have high homocysteine levels and leukemia. So please bear in mind, leukemia also would be at a risk of having cardiovascular, cerebrovascular events because they have a high homocysteine level. And some of the drugs like methotrexate, phenytoin, or sulfasalazine, if someone is on long-term these drugs, that also poses a risk of them having high homocysteine. So these are some of the systemic conditions which possibly can keep in mind, which, which uh, tend to increase the homocysteine levels. So just reflecting again on the types of homocysteinemia, again, as I said, the commonest is the genetic mutation in the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase and 16 beta synthetase, and they remain the commonest types. So based on that, they have divided on the types. Type 1 is where you have defects in the, where there is mutation in the 16 beta synthetase. Type 2 is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase uh, mutations, which is more common. 40% of the time, these are the mutations. Type 3 is where there is vitamin B12 deficiency and type 4 is where you have lack of absorption at the terminal ileum and the cecum levels. So these are the types of homocysteinemia. And the normal homocysteine levels should be in 5 to 15 micromoles per liter. And this can vary between the genders, between male and female. These levels can fluctuate. And homocysteine, when we measure homocysteine levels, they are present in the body in three forms. Homocysteine can be bound to the protein. So it can be present as a protein bound or it can be present in the free form as a disulfide, uh, disulfide form or sulfhydryl form. So these are the two free forms. But lab, when we measure homocysteine, it factors in all these three components. The homocysteine that is bound to protein, disulfide and sulfhydryl, all these are measured when we measure homocysteine in the lab. And American Heart Association uh, sort of divides homocysteine into uh, mild, moderate, and severe. If you see the mild is 15 to 30, moderate is 31 to 100, and severe is more than 100 micromoles per liter. So this is the sort of classification uh, AH has put in place. So hyperhomocysteinemia, what are the ill effects? So because this is what we see. So predominantly, it causes uh, atherosclerosis and inflammatory inflammation within the atheroma that is there within the blood vessels and leading to increase in the cardiovascular event because there is a plaque 
rupture and disruption that happens because of the inflammation that tends to set in within the trauma and they're at a high risk of cardiovascular in, uh, event. And in the brain, hyperhomocysteinemia can cause cognitive impairment and it can cause to cerebral atrophy. And hyperhomocysteinemia can uh, make someone uh, be, uh, more vulnerable for schizophrenia. So they are at a much higher risk of developing schizophrenia. And hyperhomocysteinemia can cause hip fractures. So that is also found to be more common in hyperhomocysteinemia. And they can have ectopia lentis. So they have anterior or posterior dislocation of the lens. So these are the typical sort of a clinical conundrum that hyperhomocysteinemia have. But in ICU, we predominantly deal with stroke in ang or acute MI in ang patients. That's when we evaluate and do these homocysteine levels. But bear in mind, they are at a risk of schizophrenia, hip fracture, and ectopia lentis, anterior or posterior dislocation of the lens. And in elderly, it can lead to cognitive decline and cerebral progressive cerebral atrophy. So it is good to have this index of suspicion and do this level uh, very often, uh, if we do not have an index of suspicion, very unlikely we may tend to do these tests. So it is prudent that we keep this in back of mind when we are having some sort of a clinical spectrum, which tends to uh, sensitize us to the possibility of hyperhomocysteinemia. So let us look into treatments. Unfortunately, so we do treat with B12 injections, we do give folic acid, we do give pyridoxin, but if it is a genetic uh, obviously, it wouldn't uh, uh, really mitigate the effects of homocysteine because uh, that is something that is uh, not sort of uh, taken care even when you do supplementation. But having said that, we need to keep the levels at a suboptimal level. So, what does the study say? So, so this is a there are two landmark sort of a meta analysis. So, this is a meta analysis which came in stroke efficacy of homocysteine lowering therapy with folic acid in stroke prevention meta-analysis. Unfortunately, the meta-analysis which took all randomized control trials did not show any major benefit in reducing the stroke, even if you treat them. And this is another good meta-analysis, folic acid supplementation and risk of cardiovascular disease, meta-analysis of RPTs. Both these studies uh, sort of did not show major significant effect in minimizing the stroke. So, but having said that, as I said, that levels have to be kept at optimal levels. The treatment will include substituting folic acid. They have to be kept at normal level. Then we have to keep B6 at a normal level, which is pyridoxine. And we have to keep B12 with the normal levels. And so, and B12 possibly have to be given as injection if they're depleted, because even if you give B12 tablets, because most of our Indian guts have intrinsically low intrinsic factor, absorption does not happen. Either it has to be given sublingually or they have to take injections, get the level normal and maintain it with a sublingual form of B12. And, and the combination of these is shown to lower homocysteine and it tends to normalize in four to eight weeks. And it may, as I said, lowering the homocysteine may reduce the risk of stroke by 10%. These are the studies have shown, but it, but most studies have shown non-significant reduction in the risk of stroke. And it has failed to show reduction in the cardiovascular events, unfortunately. Studies have shown there can be 4% reduction in the cardiovascular. So this is the data we have. But having said all this, you would obviously want to replace it with uh, vitamins. And now I hear from my trainees that there is a combination called homocheck that is present, which has all these three vitamins folic acid, B6, and B12. Uh, so that can be possibly be replaced. And one has to keep checking whether homocysteine has normalized after the replenishment. So just to quickly recap on all the foods, dietary uh, substitutes which are high in folic acid. So that's about homocysteine. So we spoke the predominant causes would be the genetic causes and nutritional will be B12, folic acid, and pyridoxine. Pyridoxine is little rare. B12 is more common and folic acid is more common. And the risk is predominantly cardiovascular and the stroke and cognitive impairment. Keep in mind, schizophrenia, hip fractures, and ectopia lentis. If they have concomitant, keep that in mind. You may have to do homocysteine levels and you have mild, moderate, and severe. And treatment is very simple, giving these vitamins. So just to recap, all the foods that are high in folic acid. So as you see, folic acid is present in all vegetables. So you can eat one banana every day and broccoli. And uh, uh, so you have these uh, beetroots and citrus fruits. So they are good in folic acid. So it is easy. 
एक था फोलिक एसिड फोलिक एसिड इज इजी एंड दिस इज पपाया एंड एंड दिस इज द स्पिनच सो फोलिक एसिड इज इजी बट द प्रॉब्लम इज विद विटामिन बी6 सो इट्स इट्स प्रेजेंट इन ऑल द नट्स इफ यू सी वॉलनट्स गार्लिक पिस्टैचियोस इजी वे टू ईट नट्स and all the meats anyone who is not veg i think uh, almonds all the nuts or chicken fish and meat has it and avocado also has b6 and b12 b12 predominantly animal products so it is present in milk though for vegetarians for vegetarians they can take pear and cheese cheese pear and milk for non vegetarians it is present in chicken salmon fish has the highest b12 and nuts so if you want nuts and pyridoxin uh, i mean if you want pyridoxin and b12 you can stick to nuts walnuts pistachio almond so nuts are good to get all this vitamin so that's about it uh, so i request all our listeners to attend to our signature event global intensive care happening on from 18 to 20th october in namma bengaluru so I request all our listeners to submit valuable work to journal of acute care and visit my website to read to this lecture so thank you so thank you one more